This is Dr. Elliot McGookin at 45 Surf University on why you should read Homer. Uh, to begin, here's the preface of uh, one of the great translations, George Chapman, uh, George Chapman's translation to Homer's Iliad. The preface to the reader. Of all books extant in all kinds, Homer is the first and best. No one before his, Josephus affirms, nor before him, saith Velius Paterculus, was there any whom he imitated, nor after him any that could imitate him. And that poetry may be no cause of detraction from all the eminence we give him. Spondanus, preferring it to all arts and sciences, unanswerably argues and proves, for to the glory of God and the singing of his glories no man dares deny man was chiefly made. And what art performs this chief end of man with so much excitation and expression as poetry? Moses, David, Solomon, Job, Essay, Jeremy, and all, chiefly using that to the end above said. And since the excellent of it cannot be obtained by the labor and art of man, as all easily confess it, it must needs be acknowledged a divine infusion. To prove which, in a word, this distich, in my estimation, serves something nearly. Great poetry, blind Homer, makes all see, thee capable of all arts, none of thee. For out of Homer, according to our most grave and judicial Plutarch, are all arts deduced, confirmed, or illustrated. It is not therefore the world's of vilifying of it that can make it vile, for so we might argue and blaspheme the most incomparably sacred. It is not of the world indeed, but like truth hides itself from it. Nor is there any such reality of wisdom's truth in all human excellence as in poets' fictions. Uh, there he's echoing Aristotle, who stated that uh, poetry and story were more important than history, as poetry and story concerned themselves with the ideals of men and the way things ought to be, as opposed to the way things that are and were. Now we turn towards the uh, introduction of another excellent translation uh, by Alexander Pope. And here is his preface to Homer's Iliad. Homer is universally allowed to have had the greatest invention of any writer whatever. The praise of judgment Virgil has justly contested with him, and others may have their pretensions as to particular excellences, but his invention remains yet unrivaled. Nor is it a wonder if he has ever been acknowledged the greatest of poets who most excelled in that which is the very foundation of poetry. It is the invention in that different degrees distinguishes all great geniuses. The utmost stretch of human study, learning, and industry, which masters everything besides, can never attain to this. It furnishes art with all her materials, and without it, judgment itself can at best but steal wisely. For art is only like a prudent steward that lives on managing the riches of nature. Whatever praises may be given to works of judgment, there is not even a single beauty in them to which the invention must not contribute. As in the most regular gardens, art can only reduce the beauties of nature to more regularity. In such a figure, which the common eye may better take in and is therefore more entertained with. And perhaps the reason why common critics are inclined to prefer a judicious and methodical genius to a great and fruitful one is because they find it easier for themselves to pursue their observations through an uniform and bounded walk of art than to comprehend the vast and various extent of nature. Our author's work is a wild paradise where if we cannot see all the beauty so distinctly as in an ordered garden, it is only because the number of them is infinitely greater. It is like a copious nurse nursery, which contains the seeds and first productions of every kind, out of which those who followed him have but selected some particular plant, each according to his fancy, to cultivate and beautify. If some things are too luxuriant, 
It is owing to the richness of the soil. And if others are not arrived to perform perfection or maturity, it is only because they are overrun and oppressed by those of a stronger nature. It is to the strength of this amazing invention we are to attribute that unequaled fire and rapture which is so forcible in Homer, that no man of a true poetical spirit is master of himself while he reads him. What he writes is of the most animated nature imaginable. Everything moves, everything lives, and is put into action. And the wonderful preface to uh, Alexander Pope's Iliad goes on, and I highly recommend you get both translations. I think the key to reading Homer, uh, especially as most of us don't have time to learn ancient Greek, is to get our hands as a, on many different English translations as possible. Now, Alexander Pope was criticized because he wrote it in uh, basically I am rhyming iambic pentameter. Uh, so he had to fit the Greek poetry into English poetry and then also marry it to rhyme. Uh, and a lot of people argue that that puts too much constraint on the poem. Uh, so some people prefer George Chapman and Samuel Butler. Samuel Butler basically uh, it reads more like a novel. He doesn't have it line by line, but it's paragraph by paragraph. And it's more of a literal translation where he took the Greek word and meaning and just found the best English word, not worrying about rhyme. I generally find those types of translations more readable. Alexander Pope, I can understand, but mostly because I've read other translations, so I can see what he's saying. Uh, so he always seems a little bit impeded by the fact he has to make everything rhyme. And here I will uh, review a uh, few other people's opinions on the great poet Homer. Homer, the sovereign poet. poet. That was Dante Alighieri in uh, The Inferno. Here we have uh, Alexander the Great at the Tomb of Achilles, as quoted by Cicero in Pro Archia 24. O happy youth, in having found a Homer to celebrate thy virtues. Aristotle in his Poetics states, As in the serious style, Homer is preeminent among poets, for he alone combined the dramatic form with the excellence of imitation, so he too first laid down the main lines of comedy by dramatizing the ludicrous instead of writing personal satire. His Marguerites bears the same relation to comedy that the Iliad and Odyssey do to tragedy. Here's Matthew Arnold on translating Homer, uh, 1861. The translator of Homer should above all be penetrated by a sense of four qualities of his author that he is eminently rapid, that he is eminently plain and direct, both in the evolution of his thought and in the expression of it, that is, both in his syntax and in his words, that he is eminently plain and direct in the substance of his thought, that is, in his matter and ideas, and finally, that he is eminently noble. So Homer is eminently noble, eminently rapid and eminently plain and direct. Then here's a lecture, Hugh Blair Lectures on Rhetoric and Bell's Letters uh, from 1784. Homer is the most simple in his style of all the great poets and resembles most the style of the poetical parts of the Old Testament. That's what uh, the George Chapman was alluding to earlier. They can have no conception of his manner who are acquainted with him in Mr. Pope's translation only. An excellent poetical performance that translation is, and faithful in the main to the original. In some places, it may be thought to have even improved Homer. It has certainly softened some of his rudenesses and added delicacy and grace to some of his sentiments. But with all, it is no other than Homer modernized. In the midst of the elegance and luxuriancy of Mr. Pope's language, we lose sight of the old bard simplicity. I know indeed no author to whom it is more difficult to do justice in translation than Homer. And there again, he's uh, kind of echoing the fact that because Pope wrote a highly poetic, rhyming, iambic pentameter metered 
uh, rendition of the Iliad in translation, he was somewhat limited and uh, might have, uh, what you lose in that is the wonderful simplicity and the profound simplicity uh, that was Homer in the original. Here we have George Chapman, his dedication to Achilles' shield from 1598. Homer's poems were writ from a free fury, an absolute and full soul. Virgil's out of a courtly, laborious, and altogether imitator imitator spirit. Not a simile he hath, but is Homer's. Not an invention, person, or disposition, but is wholly originally built upon Homerical foundations, and in many places hath the very words Homer useth. All Homer's books are such as have been precedents ever since of all sorts of poems, imitating none, nor ever worthily imitated by any. So George Chapman is basically saying uh, that Virgil's Aeneid, uh, basically, I mean, Virgil acknowledged that very, very much so, that uh, the Aeneid uh, basically copied the Iliad in the first six books, the, the general plot of it, and uh, I mean the Odyssey in the first six books and the Iliad in the second six books of the Aeneid. So uh, the wonderful thing that George Chapman is saluting was uh, while the Aeneid was kind of written for more political reasons and to form a solid foundation history of Rome, uh, Homer uh, were writ from a free fury, an absolute and full soul. Here's G.K. Chesterton, The Everlasting Man from 1925. Somewhere along the Ionian coast opposite Crete and the islands was a town of some sort, probably of the sort that we should call a village or hamlet with a wall. It was called Ilion, but it never came to be called Troy, and the name will never perish from the earth. A poet who may have been a beggar and a ballad monger, who may have been unable to read and write, and was described by tradition as a blind, uh, composed a poem about the Greeks going to war with this town to recover the most beautiful woman in the world. That the most beautiful woman in the world lived in that one little town sounds like a legend. That the most beautiful poem in the world was written by somebody who knew of nothing larger than such little towns is an historical fact. Uh, so Chesterton's remarking on uh, Homer's greatness sprang, you know, from, uh, I mean, as the saying goes, Homer never read Homer. He had to come up with everything on his own. And he wasn't associated with any major metropolis. He wasn't part of uh, New York publishing or the Hollywood film industry. But he, uh, everything sp sprang from within. John Dryden, in his preface to Fables Ancient and Modern in 1700, I have found by trial Homer a more pleasing task than Virgil. For the Grecian is more according to my genius than the, than the Latin poet is. Virgil was of a quiet, sedate temper. Homer was violent, impetuous, and full of fire. The chief talent of Virgil was proprietary thoughts and ornament of words. Homer was rapid in his thoughts and took all the liberties, both of numbers and of expressions, which his language, language and the age in which he lived allowed him. So again, we see uh, somebody saluting the rapidity of Homer. Uh, basically, how efficient and simple and succinct he is and how much he says in so few words, giving, it, giving his poetry the feel that he's moving so fast. And then we have, uh, from 1635, uh, Thomas Haywood noted in the Hierarchy of the Blessed Angels, Seven cities warred for Homer being dead, who living had no roof to shroud his head. Then John Keats, who uh, stayed up all night re reputedly uh, reading uh, Homer's Iliad upon his first encounter, wrote a poem on first looking into Chapman's Homer. And again, it was George Chapman's translation that he favored. Uh, his poem reads, Oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep-browed Homer ruled as his demence. Yet never did I breathe its pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken. C.S. Lewis, in a preface to Paradise Lost in 1942, wrote, 
Once the diction has been established, it works of itself. Almost anything Homer wants to say has only to be turned into this orthodoxy and ready-made diction, and it becomes poetry. Whatever Miss T eats turns to, into Miss T. Then uh, Longinus on the Sublime, section 9, says, In the Odyssey one may liken Homer to the setting sun, of which the grandeur remains without the intensity. Plato in the Republic, uh, circa 380 B.C., in section 10.595c, translated by P. Shorey, the first teacher and beginner of all these beauties of tragedy. Uh, it, it had widely been saying that Homer educated Greece. Then Alexander Pope, an essay on criticism from 1711, lines 134 to 135, Pope states, But when to examine every party came, nature and Homer were, he found the same. It's that whole idea that uh, Homer is the natural world. He is nature. He's human nature. He encompasses it all. So it's, it's in the exact same manner that anybody can go walking through beautiful countryside like Yosemite and uh, Bryce Canyon and all the national parks. You can see so much beautiful scenery, but everybody will see something different. So what basically... Uh, uh, Alexander Pope is saying is that's a testament to Homer's supreme genius that he could create a world so big that is so complete that uh, so many of us will see so many different parts of it. Alexander Pope in 1727 preface to the Iliad which I was reading from earlier states our author's work is a wild paradise where if we cannot see all the beauty so distinctly as in an ordered garden it is only because the number of them is infinitely greater. It is like a copious nursery which contains the seeds and first productions of every kind, out of which those who followed him have but selected some particular plants, each according to his fancy, to cultivate and beautify. If some things are too luxuriant, it is owing to the richness of the soil, and if others not arrive to perfection or maturity, it is only because they are overrun and oppressed by those of a stronger nature. Alexander Pope also writes, we acknowledge Homer, the father of poetical diction, the first who taught that language of the gods to men. Then Bertrand Russell, in A History of Western Philosophy, uh, Part 1, The Pre-Socratics, Chapter 1, The Rise of Greek Civilization, wrote that Homer was the first noble product of the Hellenic civilization. Uh, the famous poet Percy Bysshe Shelley in A Defense of Poetry, which is a wonderful essay, wrote, The poems of Homer and his contemporaries were the delight of infant Greece. They were the elements of that social system which is the column upon which all succeeding civilization has reposed. Homer embodied the ideal perfection of his age and human character. Nor can we doubt that those who read his verses were awakened to an ambition of becoming, like to Achilles, Hector, and Ulysses. The truth and beauty of friendship, patriotism, and persevering devotion to an object were unveiled to the depths in these immortal creations. Uh, so I love that part where Shelley's saying that uh, it exalts friendship and heroism uh, and heroics and patriotism. And uh, it's no coincidence that Socrates in founding Western philosophy compared himself to Achilles. Uh, saying, you know, Achilles didn't feel death, and even though Achilles knew he was going to die, he chose death over dishonor when he returned to battle. And uh, Socrates used that uh, same logic and inspiration to state that I cannot stop teaching that uh, virtue is the highest good, and I refuse to do so, if it, even if it means I have to die many times. And here Socrates quoted in the dialogues of dialogues of Plato, Ian, he says, but how did you come to have the skill about Homer only and not about Hesiod or the other poets? Does not Homer speak of the same themes which all other poets handle? Is not war his great argument and does he not speak of human society and intercourse of men, good and bad, skilled and unskilled, and of the gods conversing with one another and with mankind, and about what happens in heaven and in the world below, and the generations of gods and heroes? 
Are not these the themes of which Homer sings? Socrates saluting how transcendent and encompassing Homer is. Uh, then Virgil noted that it is easier to steal the club of Hercules than a line from Homer. Uh, note earlier that it was uh, Chapman was accusing Virgil of actually taking lines from Homer, but I guess he didn't get away with it because Chapman noticed. And then finally, uh, Francis Whalen, the Iliad and the Bible, reported in Hoyt's new Cyclopedia of Practical Quotations, 1922. Uh, Wayland writes, It was Homer who gave laws to the artist. It was Homer who inspired the poet. Uh, so that's just a few introductory remarks as to the greatness of the Homer and his Iliad and Odyssey. And you should definitely read them. I look forward to many, many, many more lectures on the Iliad and Odyssey, as well as uh, there's no shortage of many, many more uh, folks praising them. For instance, Thomas Jefferson stated in his later years, as we advance in life, they all fall off one by one till we're left with Virgil and Homer, and perhaps Homer alone. And Abraham Lincoln, in his younger years, was known to uh, carry around a copy. In his younger, clean-shaven years, he'd carry around a copy of Homer's Iliad, and he'd say, if you want to know anything about humanity, you have to begin with this book. Uh, so I look forward to many further lectures on Homer's Iliad. This is Dr. Elliot Magookin, 45 Surf University.